It's 129. That's an odd one. It's your turn, Andrew. That describes me exactly. This is Control Structure, episode 129 for May 31st, 2017. Big, huge week to everyone listening. This show has notes. Visit thenexus.tv slash cs129 to see them. As mentioned, I am Andrew Bailey, the host, and with me today is the other host, Stephen Orvis. Hi. Hi. So, um, how have you been? Oh, I've been pretty good. Been uh, enjoying the summer. We made it out turkey hunting on Saturday. Uh, I saw a turkey flying away when I was heading back towards the house, but uh, had a good time there. Saw a couple of deer. So, um, the I haven't seen a turkey uh, since that one ducked out of the way on the sidewalk that one time, that last time. Um, although there is, uh, it was like a few days ago that I looked out into my backyard from my kitchen and saw a chipmunk uh, messing with a, a pair of cardinals in the backyard. Oh, really? Yeah. So, um, yeah. At first, I thought he had gone away because it looked like he was, like, burrowing somewhere in the yard. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then I didn't see him for a few days and then saw him messing with the cardinals, so I guess he's still around. You just need a good cat. We have a cat that, like, every day you see it with a chipmunk out in the yard. <laughs> now, I haven't figured out if it's the same chipmunk or different ones, though, because I never see it eating them. The other day, I was watching him, and he actually, the one he was playing with, got away. So, I mean, maybe they just play every day. <laughs> so, uh, and then, of course, I have seen a few rabbits around. Rabbits? Rabbits. Aha. So, uh, yeah, interesting wildlife over here in Pennsylvania. So, um, let's see. So, uh, you pretty much hang out with your uh, family every uh, every weekend, not just on Memorial Day. Yeah, pretty much every weekend. So, um, you know, even though it's a holiday, uh, I didn't really do family things. Uh, I pretty much mostly did bike rides. Uh, I must have done, like, at least 50, 60 miles or so. Uh, over the extended weekend. That's quite a bit of miles to put on your bike. Yeah, so um, then uh, Sunday was supposed to like rain, but it, mm-hmm. but it ended up not really, but that was okay because uh, uh, so at church we uh, like did a graduation celebration or something. So I invited Zach and Rachel over and uh, we had a little cookout. So now I have like... Uh, you know, made up a whole bunch of casserole and some hot dogs, and I want to eat eat as much as I can before uh, my brother moves in next Sunday, uh, and then my parents will come over, and then you know we'll you know have a nice family party and stuff, and move my brother in and stuff. Uh, so uh, you know we'll do that. So and then also have another cookout. Um, so yeah, my mom is bringing over, uh, baked beans like she did that last time. Um, so yeah, uh, next time, uh, we may have, uh, another person, like, being, like, walking through or something. So, uh, by the way, my brother totally does not look my, like me. Okay. <laughs> um, my, the joke is, uh, his dad is Camel Joe. Uh, my dad is the guy under the bridge. Okay. So, um, so yeah, that's going to be a, a big thing happening. And I still have like the boxes and the old parts from, uh, the, you know, from the episode I built my computer, that's still in the dining room there. <laughs> so like that needs to like be gone, uh, like pretty fast. And, Luxuries of living alone. <laughs> yes. And like maybe like tidy up, uh, a few things around here. Uh, you know, and of course, like, also things like scrub the shower. <laughs> so, yeah. just just give them the impression that at first it's good, <laughs> and then lull him into a false sense of security. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And now for this episode's LOL Vim. 
Ah, uh, them. I, 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 that's like my favorite text editor. So uh, Stack Overflow uh, did a blog post, and um, apparently their most popular question is, how do I exit Vim? How do you exit Vim? Yeah, why would you want to exit? Why, exactly? Yeah, it, that's why it's so hard to do, because like it's so great and stuff. Like People get stuck in there for years. Why would you even want to leave? Maybe you want to like I don't know play a game or like watch a podcast of me building a PC. That's that's why they gave us multiple uh, 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 the name slips me now terminal sessions uh, so that you can go to different places to see TTY three four five six of course good old seven. So uh, you're on a laptop, so I'm guessing like maybe on a desktop you'd have more than that. I, th I think they may go up to uh, eight and eh, they might just be. On. I think by default they go from one to one six. to seven. Oh yes, seven technically is one. It's just the run the the UI in or yeah. UI X X org X org yeah. yeah in seven. Handy trick though. If it X org locks up, you can go jump in and fix things. Yeah, I've I've done that before. So uh, hey, it's speaking like of tab browsing. So speaking about X org, like you know how how all those tutorials. Of like you know how to fix your you know X X is not starting so you need to go into the X configuration file uh -huh. and every single one of those uses Vim. I mean that's just the best editor to be using. You can use search in there, find and replace, jump to line, okay. repeat that would, last action. Would, would you like some more G and U, Richard Stallman? <laughs> 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 so. Um, yeah, I can totally uh, synthesize with this, uh, but this was like back when I was a, a noob. But um, like normally when I want to uh, like edit files on the command mm -hmm. line, it's just to tweak a little thing here or there, which Nano is like infinitely more well suited for. Like you can just type up Nano, and it has all of like the shortcuts at the bottom of the screen. It's like it's like a cheat sheet right there. It, it, it's got the help, too, there. I mean, it, it, you press Control c and it very clearly tells you exactly how to edit, exit. Well, yeah, but it doesn't exactly tell you, oh, you need to hit escape or something. Uh, like, the whole, like, modes of insert. Well, that's for c command mode versus insert mode. But let's see, let's go to insert mode and then press, uh, so we're in insert mode, obviously. Okay, so then Control and quit. Okay, it's, it's true if I type... Oh, and ah, wait, look at that. Oh, what it did does. It. Let's see what it does. So let's try that again. So I'm in, I'm in insert mode. Hello, Andrew. And I'm going to press control C. Ah, control C. There we go. So it came up. I pressed it twice. Yeah. And it popped the type colon quit to exit Vim. So then you do colon quit. Uh, Enter it really right <laughs> in brackets. <laughs> and trailing. then it says trailing characters. <laughs> Wow, I, I didn't know you could, like, uh, attach trailers to this. Uh, apparently it has trailers. <laughs> so, like, uh, how like how much can it tow? Like, can you do campers with that? <laughs> I, I don't know. We'd have to see what the, the tow rating is there. <laughs> but it's actually rather interesting, though, because they have clearly handled the Control-C command. Uh, maybe it's because quit, though, has... To quit, you have to check to see if it's been saved. And if you want to not save... Or versus save, maybe they're forcing you that route logically so that they can make sure you explicitly say, I don't want to save this file. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, it stubbornly remains, like, the default editor. Uh, so, like, Ubuntu is, like, considered more user-friendly, so I think it in more places it defaults to Nano. So, like, especially if you try to set up a cron tab, like, it'll say, use this one. See, I never really got Nano. It uh, like I tried it a couple of times. Everyone's so like, "Well, you don't even need to learn. It just works for you." I guess it didn't just work for me. Like I still felt like I needed to learn something. And at that point in time, I was like, "Why? Why am I?" If I, okay, so you can go to any Unix style system, any place, and VI is there. Like it's just what about Vim? Vim VI, basically the same thing. <laughs> it's just always there with you. And yeah. You can learn that, or you can go 
to learn nano and someday you're gonna land in a system and you're gonna be stuck in vim <laughs> and then guess what you won't know how to exit well do the control c colon exit whatever pseudo apt get install nano <laughs> <laughs> ah but it could be yum you don't know what what uh, system you're on well then it'll complain that you cannot no... find apt get <laughs> Or, or what, what is pseudo? I don't know what pseudo yeah, is. What, what is this thing you speak of? It doesn't mean false. So must, you want me to falsely be. run something? Obviously. <laughs> so, um, this has, uh, this report has triggered, uh, uh, like a lot of, uh, you know, talking around the internet and it has already made it its way into uh, web comics. So, yeah. Very nice. So, I, uh, anything else to add? I was just going to say, I like the stats they did on that page. I thought that was interesting. They were showing the different languages that, that people, like, statistically, like the countries, China was the least likely to be stuck. Uh, or at least search for this phrase. Yeah, like, Asian countries, like, East Asian countries, like, were, like, the least amount visited from. Specifically the two countries that are known for hacking us. <laughs> The Republic of Korea, they they really don't hack us. Ah, uh, okay. It's a th see, I don't know which one's north and which one's south. The if it has people in it, it means it's communist. Ha! Okay, the people. Uh, I'll I'll have to remember that one. So, anyways, the the China one though specifically. Ah, see, are the ones from Korea though? Are they using the correct IP address or are they routing it to the other one to blame it on their <laughs> their uh, other country over there? Anyways. Uh, languages jQuery and CSS and Angular JS were high. So divided um, divided by tag the user visited most frequently, uh, showing the sixteen most common tags. So, uh, like if someone asks how do I exit Vim or visits this question, and then take a look at like what's what's their most popular tag, like you can f figure out that front end people you know struggle a lot with this. So like uh, like web front end people, you know, people doing you know JavaScript, CSS, and like even C sharp and stuff. Like these people live in GUIs. Like they're not like you know command line interfaces are completely alien and foreign to them. Yeah, they don't mostly end up with that. Even though there is the web server aspect, sometimes it's good to know how to log in to the shell and do things. Whereas, but, uh, whereas people running Python, C, C++, and apparently Ruby uh, don't really struggle with this. Uh, let's see, then this guy says, uh, you know, if if I take a look at my myself, uh, this would be R for me. <laughs> uh, which is apparently like a statistics-driven language or something. Interesting. Which... That which he used to make all these graphs. <laughs> so there is, I just just was thinking about it. There is actually a VI tutorial. I just don't remember the command. Maybe open VI, and then somehow you can get into a VI tutorial. It's kind How about, of neat. Uh, man VI? Mm, I might have it. Let's see. It doesn't have tutorial listed. It's a VI tutorial. I actually discovered it one day. I was blown away with how good it was. Huh. Uh, and it's like, it's in all the operating systems, more or less. Uh, command. Well, well, uh, all the operating systems outside Microsoft. Outside. Well, they have Linux integrated now. You can get Well, that. not quite yet. <laughs> like, I think that's only with the uh, creators update, which is not uh, fully distributed yet. So, yeah. Go ahead and figure that out and uh, put that in the show notes. Sure. So um, you may have remembered uh, once upon a time that I built a PC with a Ryzen chip in it. I, I remember something about that <laughs> and, and like there were benchmarks and... Yeah, and like and a really cool happened. video, like a really cool video as well. So um, it keeps on getting better. So... AGESA, or the AMD Generic Encapsulated System Architecture, is kind of like uh, like the starting point for the UEFI uh, firmware on motherboards. So, 
uh, they just AMD just released version 1.0.0.6, uh, or at least us, you know, they uh, you know did a release of details about this, uh, which uh, is going to have a whole boatload of uh, memory parameter knobs, 26 of them along with a wider range and finer steppings of memory frequencies. So, uh, like, there's going to be, like, more ways you can tweak your RAM uh, parameters so that you can jack up your RAM frequency. Um, and also, uh, the frequency itself is going to be, like, not so big of a jumps. So instead of going from, like, 2966 directly to 3200 mm -hmm. like it'll have something between there uh and it'll go from like i think they said like 2100 megahertz to 4000 so does this allow you to find more closer to the range that's working best for your ram is that the yeah, idea i think so yeah so uh i guess i might finally be able to run uh my ram at 3200 megahertz uh, like it said on the box, uh, or at least faster than the 2133 that I am currently running at. So, like, right now I'm only using my RAM at, like, 66% uh, capacity. Of the speed. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, with this, hopefully I will be able to jack it up. So now these updates, uh, it's kind of like flashing a BIOS, I assume, too? Um, kind of. So, like, you know how, like, phone manufacturers take Android and then customize it. Yes. Uh, like the same thing happens with motherboard manufacturers. They'll take this AGSA thing and, and then they'll add their own stuff onto it. I see. And then they'll release the images. So uh, my particular board, I uh, was like, I just saw this and then I'm like, okay, well, maybe there's like another update. And there was, although it didn't have this because apparently this is not released quite yet. Like, it just means that this, like, all this good memory stuff mm -hmm. is just coming. It's just I uh, haven't gotten around to doing it yet. Yeah, and uh, AMD says that it should be available starting mid to late June. So, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, as far as, uh, like, this might not sound too interesting, but due to the way that Ryzen is built... Uh, memory frequency impacts more than just the memory. So uh, Ryzen is built with like two quad core modules uh, with something called infinity fabric between them. So like you'll have like your eight cores like uh, divided up into two sets of four. So uh, apparently this infinity fabric is not quite infinite because it runs at the speed of your RAM. So then... By making your RAM faster than that, or allows yep. that to be faster. So yeah, by making your RAM faster, it makes the communication between the CPUs uh -huh. faster, even though it does not technically touch RAM. Hmm. Like, they'll be able to talk to each other faster, which, like, I've actually seen benchmarks that prove this increases system performance. So that will be a pretty big deal then to get that faster. Yeah, so... Uh, like I was actually, I forget what exactly the article was about. Um, oh, I think it was like, uh, one of the next articles that I commented, uh, like someone said, it's like, well, Ryzen is going to be my next CPU at home. And then I'm like, yeah, I built, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's a great chip, but it has lousy RAM support. Uh, to which someone replied, uh, you know, I, I think I mentioned is like, yeah, I hope th this uh, this announcement from last week will help a lot. Mm -hmm. So then another guy came on and said, I like my motherboard has uh, like a beta version of this and I have two 16 gigabyte sticks uh, rated for 3200 megahertz. But he said he was running at like 3600 or something. Uh, and like, yeah, this is just my anecdotal thing. Then to which I replied. Yeah, that's like my exact setup. <laughs> so, yeah, I uh, have good hopes for this. So, um, that last episode of ours, we mentioned AMD Threadripper. Uh, so, apparently, AMD wasn't exactly done announcing that, and the next day announced Epic, 
Apparently they wanted to get fancy and spell epic with a Y. Interesting. Uh, uh, this is a huge server chip with 32 cores on it. And because this is like the same uh, Zen architecture, it'll have uh, 64 uh, threads on it. So like this chip is like monstrous and it has mm-hmm. essentially um, like uh, instead of like having like one Ryzen die on it, it'll have four. So then the Ryzen is uh, octa-core, right? Yeah, it has eight. So four times eight. Yeah. So you can see this guy holding the chip right there. It's like, pretty crazy. Yeah. And it looks pretty sizable. Like uh like maybe about like a P four? Um <laughs> no, like maybe more like a Pentium two. Sort of like the size of like half a cell phone almost, mm-hmm. if not like a you know, like a full size like iPhone or something. So, yeah, that's going to be a very uh, wide chip with eight memory channels and 128 PCIe lanes. So, yeah, this is going to be a monster chip for servers. I, I'm thinking that could make a pretty nice desktop chip, too. See, I, I was forgetting how small the P4 was, but I think you're right now that you say that. that the yeah, like P2s pen- were bigger. Yeah, Pentium 4s were... They were just square like that. Yeah, yeah. like if... If you've ever handled a Core 2 chip? Mm, I probably have. Yeah, because uh, pen, like the Pentium 4s eventually came in that same socket. Ah, uh, okay. I need to find my... I have a chip. I forget if it's a P1 or a P2, something like that. So, uh, like, I think I think I saw uh, one here. It might have been on the last last page. Uh See, no, that's that's one of the, that's like, like a socket adapter or something there. No, that's that was like the original one. I see. Although, like an original Pentium, uh, like looked an awful lot like that, like an actual socket seven. I see, like if you actually probably search uh, Google keyword uh, Pentium socket seven, like when you were saying like the price tag in the middle of the chip, yes. I, I thought it would be more like this. Yeah, I want to say it did look a bit like that. I'll do bring mine, mine although, over sometime. Although the one over there and up, yeah, that one, or that one mm-hmm. there, I think is a Socket 8, maybe? But yeah, Socket 8 chips look a little weird because, uh, like, you know how the pins here kind of like go diagonally like yeah. this? A Socket 8 chip has half of the pins going like that and half of them in like a regular grid. So they're just trying to make it easier to bend the pins? <laughs> Maybe, or... Probably directional, I'm sure. Uh, very directional. Mm-hmm. So, hey, I guess Intel has paid attention to uh, all of this uh, Zen stuff going on. And they're jealous of like AMD being in this Zen mode. So they've finally introduced the i9 branding for their... $1,000 plus dollar Extreme Edition desktop uh, CPUs. Uh, so, like, they've pretty much done these Extreme Editions pretty much since the tail end of their Pentium 4s. So, like, in other words, like, ridiculously priced uh, CPUs that actually offer, like, quite a bit more performance than, like, the, uh, the top-of-the-line, uh, like, normal desktop CPUs. But, um... So when I remember back way back when uh, Intel introduced like their i3, i5, and the i7 mm-hmm. chips, and then like there's like the regular i7s and there's the extreme i7s, and from what I heard is that like uh, I think it was like retailers didn't want Intel to like have like an i9 because like it would make people like. Uh, sort of wonder is like okay well what is this other thing you know and they would kind of be disappointed because the shop would not carry that because like this is like you know obviously highly priced Uh and probably not a lot of volume in sales (laughs) so like i guess these stores didn't really feel that they needed to stock these interesting so that's why intel has not did an i9 up until Mm -hmm. now uh, so they are also doing a, I guess it looks like a mid-generation refresh called the X series. So I guess 
this this is kind of complicated to me because up until now, like the like Intel would have like a sixty seven hundred uh, CPU, a sixty eight hundred CPU, then like a sixty nine hundred X CPU. The X standing for Extreme mm-hmm. Edition, but now they've replaced like a, uh, now they've gone and put X on a whole lot of other CPUs that obviously are not the really expensive ones. So it just sells better if it's got X next to it. Yeah. It's extreme in some way. Uh-huh. Um so they've, you know, done like a few tweaks to this uh like to their existing chips. Uh so, you know, I guess this is good that AMD is having an effect on their competition. Yeah. Because this is like what if you did not get a get an AMD CPU uh, in the past month that like, this is what you were, what you should have been hoping for. Am I making myself clear there? <laughs> the, the free market works, mm-hmm. I guess. <laughs> it does. So speaking about Intel uh, next year, they will supposedly offer Thunderbolt three licenses, royalty free and not exclusive, uh, just like USB. So, uh, you know, like way back in the day, uh, USB was actually uh, implemented and like thought up by Intel, and then they kind of like it's like, hey, this is good stuff. Let's let's take over the market with this. Uh, so then, like around two thousand nine or something, they started uh, working on uh, what would become Thunderbolt, and uh, up until now, it's pretty much been on Apple. Uh, machines so you know as you pointed out uh like i'm not sure if it was on the fringe or before the fringe that uh thunderbolt connectors are usb-c connectors so they're like nice and reversible and uh so the direction doesn't matter yes yeah so like thunderbolt uh has like a lot more capacity and like a lot more uh like electrical capacity Mm -hmm. as well so uh you know, this is kind of like the next step beyond uh, USB, it looks like. So, like, I am I wonder if, like, if you plug a USB device into a Thunderbolt uh, plug, if it will work on USB. See, from what I was reading their article, that they were saying they were working with Microsoft to, on the philosophy that if you can plug it in, it works. Meaning, from the way I interpreted it, they were saying that they wanted it just to be the hardware is there. If you can physically plug it in, C or Thunderbolt, we're going to make it work. Yeah. So, you know, even though this was conjured up by Intel, you know, the hope is that even uh, AMD will be able to uh, put this onto their boards as well. Uh, And it looks like uh, Intel will be integrating Thunderbolt, uh, like a Thunderbolt controller, straight into their CPUs which uh, will definitely spur adoption Mm -hmm. Uh, because up until now, I guess it's been just an external chip of some kind, which like that means like there's an additional part on the board and like there's uh, like additional, you know, electricity going to it, which for like a laptop on a battery, that's kind of bad. Bigger deal. Yeah. Yeah. So for desktops, probably it doesn't impact AMD much, but for the mobile market, it might be a, a bigger difference then. Yeah. So yeah, you gotta have uh, phones transferring lots of data fast over wires. Wires. Wait, aren't you? Aren't is aren't phones supposed to be like not wires? <laughs> so in a move of common sense, you can't use patents to control products after sale. So in a sort of long uh, legal fight uh, that Lexmark has been waging against people who buy uh, used empty cartridges and fill them and resell them. Uh, Lexmark has, I think, tried the, you know, the DMCA by putting DRM into uh, printer cartridges. Then there is, uh, uh, you know, copyright law that they've tried to do this. And now they've tried to uh, throw patent law to, you know, essentially stop people from, you know, refilling cartridges and reselling them. Uh, because apparently Lexmark feels that they have locked down the market and they, you know, uh, since this is like their interest, they will, you know, send lawyers to make sure that, 
you know, these interests are protected. Uh, and, you know, logically, uh, you can't really use patents to control things, uh, you know, after you sell them. Because patents, you know, that involves like the design and manufacture of things and not the use of things, uh, right? Yes, that's the whole point of patents is to protect your right to sell things. The funny thing about this all is, though, is I get the feeling that if, even if it was to have gone through so the people couldn't refill them anymore, I think that people would probably stop using Lexmark's if the ink's expensive and they can go to a different competitor and refill the ink there, I mean, why not? Yeah, I mean, sure. So, you know, Lexmark, although usually what I see around offices now are HP printers. Yeah, like Lexmark is kind of going out. I've noticed that, that they're yeah. always high and, yeah. Yeah, and um, I think it might have been, I want to say 17 years ago that, uh, like, our printer had broken at the time, mm -hmm. and my parents were like, hey, we need to get a new printer, and my uncle bought us a Lexmark, and I'm not sure if he wanted us to have a nice printer or wanted us to have a white elephant. <laughs> See, at one point in time, my parents had actually bought a Lexmark. We brought it home and looked at it and started looking at how much the cartridges were going to be, we took it back to the store and returned it. <laughs> like, we didn't open it up and use it. We just decided that this is just a bad idea. <laughs> So they they didn't really notice it when they, like, right in the store? This is, I don't know, this is kind of before the internet was that prevalent. I, I, I think they bought it and were still thinking it over, and then they decided to know they didn't want it. Because I think it was a good deal on the printer. Like, I think the printer was cheap. Like, cheaper than the cartridges? Probably. <laughs> like, I think it was that kind of cheap. So... So, uh, don't try to access certain files on Windows 7 or 8. So, uh, in a rather obscure uh, way of, uh, like, accessing files and stuff, that uh, apparently there's, like, special files uh, on NTFS that uh, are essentially, like, the dev stuff on Linux, right? Like uh, yes, there's a lot of files in Linux, like your dev, or you have your null... I uh, file that you can write to and things like that. There's the zero, there's the random, although you you really want to use the u random. Uh, then there's uh, like the uh, the SDA, the SDB and stuff for your drives and your partitions. Um, so uh, NTFS has sort of things like this, you know, things that aren't exactly files, uh, but you can still access them if you know uh, what to ask for, I guess. So apparently the C con slash con uh, it, you mentioned was like the actual physical file name that represents a physical console. Mm. Uh, it seemed like it was the input for the console. Yeah. So and, it was like it was right to it. And the screen for output. Uh, so uh, Windows correctly handled simple attempts to access the con device but a file name included two references to the special device, then Windows would crash. If that file was referenced from a web page, uh, for example, trying to load an image from C slash con slash con, the machine would crash whenever the malicious page was accessed. That feels like a hack. Yeah, so... This smells. Uh, uh, let's see. But that was like back in the old uh, Windows machines. Uh, but this time around, the special file name of choice is dollar sign capital M capital F capital T. So this smuffed is the name given to one of the special metadata files that are that is used by NTFS. Uh, so uh, let's see, let's see, and attempts to open the directory are normally blocked. Uh, but in a move reminiscent of the old Windows flaw, if the file name is used as if it were a directory name then the NTFS driver takes a lock on the file and never releases it. Every subsequent operation sits around waiting for the lock to be released forever. This blocks all other attempts to access the entire file system, so the program will start to hang, rendering the machine unusable until it is rebooted. These are rather entertaining. I was disappointed that your machine's Windows 10 now and we couldn't yeah. try it. I was going to so make you do Microsoft it. has been informed 
but the time of publication has not told us when or if the problem will be patched. So Jimmy Wales, uh, the guy that runs Wikipedia, uh, had a bet that since Wikipedia is so useful that encrypting it all you know, through HTTPS would result in less censor- censorship uh, because apparently there were other people saying that if you encrypt it all, then like if a government really wants people to not see something, they're going to have to block you know, everything. Yeah, which hasn't happened in most cases, um, which I guess is a good bet. Yeah. Uh, so this, you know, uh, this article also points out that uh, China has completely blocked Wikipedia because they're dicks. Um, so they're just that's... never blocking everything, anyways. So. Yeah. Um, so like they've apparently also taken taken the challenge to create their own, uh, you know, Wikipedia like site uh, just in Chinese. So you could. Oh, okay. They have Chinese translated version because that's what i was gonna say you could probably go out of country get a dump of a wikipedia site bring it in country and uh, set up a server if and get could, arrested if you could dodge uh, <laughs> dodge the people that be so um let's uh go back a little bit and uh go back to obscure file uh obscure linux utilities um so apparently you can process csvs uh quite nicely uh just on the linux command line um then apparently there's also a what's what's the I, i'm not seeing his command he's running there on that one so uh oh kind of, i see he's using cat yeah and then piping it into column column so that presumably is what's making these uh or translating these csv files then yeah into nice like tab separated things hmm. uh and i didn't know that there was a calendar utility Oh, this this rather calendar. Hey, hey, that is nice. So if you're deep down in in the in the 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 terminal and you've been working for days and you're not sure what day it is, you can <laughs> type cal and oh, so that's what day. So it, it is. looks you can like do a dash number and it'll print out like the months around. Aha, uh-huh, this look and see dash number three. Oops, I think I kind of forgot. Hey, it's good error handling. Nice. So uh, I can see. How about how about like dash nine? Dash nine. Let's see how how, how good it is. Uh oh. So apparently you can't push it too far then, but you can even aim what year it is and things. Let me guess. It only does three. <laughs> That's the only. Oh wow. Doesn't do two. That's really funny. It, it, yeah, it can do one and it can do three. Apparently those are your valid options. That's super funny. Um. Apparently you can factor numbers. Ah, so you can say factor, and that breaks them up into okay all the numbers that we multiply that we do it. So factor and does it pretty fast as well. Ten, so it gives you two and a five. So then you could use this in my prime number finding algorithm where I feed numbers into it and it tells me uh, if what the if it's only it in itself, right? So if you do factor six five five three six. <laughs> Then it'll spurn out a lot of twos. Nice. So uh, typing in a prime number, prime number results in <laughs> just that number. So if we get the largest prime number known, how long does it take it to tell us? So you're going to print a of, 17 megabyte number into your terminal. Kind of big. Let's not go with that one. <laughs> a large prime number. Currently, there's prizes for finding big yeah. prime numbers, like serious prizes. So uh, you can also uh, format numbers like into uh, like bytes, megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes pretty easily. Uh, then there's also a shred program, which takes a file, overwrites it with uh, like, you know, zeros or randomness or something, saves it, then deletes that file. Uh, but that's kind of making a lot of assumptions with the uh, uh, with the underlying, uh, what you might call it? the underlying file system. So shred hardware makes harder. Hmm. It's interesting. So uh, that definitely will not work on BTRFS because that's a copy on write file system. So if you write like something completely different to a file, it'll exist somewhere else on the drive and will not overwrite it. So it won't, it won't bother shredding it. Exactly.
So uh, I would like to appreciate D Bloat Windows 10. Uh, which has a handy script to uninstall all of those pesky little uh, Windows Store apps that come with Windows 10. I haven't been in... Okay, I was going to say I haven't been in Windows 10 for a while, but I did use it on my desktop so I could play Tanks the other day. You were that low on space? or I, I, I rebooted my computer and slept the Windows 10. Uh, I played Tanks, then I rebooted and went back to Linux. Let's see, I... When I did this, I pretty much did the, the uh, nuclear option uh -huh. and like pretty much removed everything. But then I didn't have the Windows calculator. Who needs the calculator? Uh, or like a uh, little widget in my start menu that uh -huh. tells me the weather. So what did you do to get it back manually or did you just wipe it and read it from the script? Um, I, as of yet, have not uh, gotten them back yet. Oh, I see. So, I mean, if I, if I want a calculator, I have a nice app on my phone that can do that. Okay. Plus, I'm sure you can download something separate place. Um, or I'll just like uh, start Python in command line and do it from there. There you go. So uh, I would like, uh, let's see, as for something that I've done recently, I've been working on tea time. So in all of that time, uh, when I was uh, trying to uh, edit the video, I kind of got the... Uh, the itch to, uh, I kind of got the itch to start working on tea time quite a bit. So apparently when you put in, I won't pronounce it, a problem number with 44 digits and call factor on it, it says, is too large. So there goes my plan of using it to find my problem numbers. <laughs> Anyways, tea time. So um, I decided to write uh, a GUI for it in, what is it, uh, TK? Which uh -huh. is like the default, uh, or not the default, but rather the uh, GUI toolkit that comes built in to Python, at least on Windows. So you can, uh, you know, download the zip file containing the feed, and then it asks, you know, to select it. Then it asks for an output file, like before it does anything else. Uh, because I also improved it that it will read its previous output and figure out what you selected before. So, uh, like the first uh, thing it does is that it, you know, uh, wants you to select certain routes mm -hmm. on, uh, like, in the feed. So kind of for what you care about. Yeah. So, as you can see, since I already did this before, it'll come up with, you know, it pre-selected in a very large list that, you know, you can just click on. Yeah. So then you can go next. It'll do a little bit of processing then it'll show you the routes that you selected along with all the stops uh, in each. So you can, you know, uh, by default, it will select them all. But if you never get off at a certain place, you don't need to know what time the yeah. train or bus or whatever is going to stop there. So you can eliminate that mm -hmm. and like it will never show up uh, in the output. So, uh, yeah, this, these are all the stops that I care about since, like, uh, I've already gone through this and selected a few, and, like, it'll even remember these. So it's just, that's all the defaults from the previous file it's remembering. Yep. Nice. So then you can hit next. Now, this is an initial setup here. Next time you run it for real, it's not going to force you through all of that? Um, well, that's me actually running through it again. Okay. So, um... Like, I've actually set it up so, like, if you run the base script, like, from the command line, uh -huh. uh, along with the zip file to process, uh, like, it'll look for that default output and, like, do all of it again so, without so asking. Is this generating the HTML file with the right data in it? Yes. Okay, I see. I wasn't understanding at first. So, uh, if we actually take a look at the output, uh, like, you can see... Uh, the script application tea time settings, which it pretty much reads all of this. So you can see selected routes, exclude stops, and everything. So is it smart about the data it includes, or does it just still dump it all? Um, so can you explain that? Uh, so if your app has the data, as I recall, you embedded the data within this page, right? Yes. So if you are filtering it for only certain stops, your page load is milliseconds longer because it's including extra data it'll never show, right? It it does if you exclude a stop, 
it will not include the, the uh, times, the stop times for that stop. So, it, so that is ripped out of the data. Then. Yes. Okay. Because uh, that was like one of the things that I wanted to do is, you know, granted I have functionality already in my script to, you know, exclude mm -hmm. some, but I don't want to have to go in there and manually type in the IDs of each of the stops that I want to exclude. Yeah. So now that I have a GUI to do that, it's a lot easier to do that. You can just process a new file off the internet and click the buttons and probably even make a default, just make me the file thing in it or just spin through them and do them. Yep, that's what it does. Nice. So um, I also have a GUI uh, for the uh, spruce. Aha. Uh -huh. Um, that, uh, you know, loads in that dictionary file and then like you can, uh, edit the dictionary and like, uh, like for irregular, uh, like plurals and irregular verbs and stuff, you can edit those. Uh, but the thing about that is that it is written in QT and not in TK. So do show me the TK and how, how it's, uh, represents the UI. I feel like something I used at one point in time had TK or hit hit it before in a program, like some Linux program, I want to say. Uh, so the multi-selector here is like pretty much the basis of everything. It's the, you know, it has the label at the top and mm -hmm. then this frame and then the scroll bar, which apparently in TK, the scroll bar is not integrated into whatever it is scrolling. So it's like a, it's an independent component. Yeah, and that you have to tie it both to the con the other control, and you have to tie the other control to the scroll bar. So it's a little more homemade and manual, even than Windows Forms. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, let's see. At the first uh, page, you know, the is the select routes. So that's the route selector. And um, so you got the main window. Um, let's see. Like, the processing of the feed is kind of interleaved with the setup. So, like... Uh, by the time that this already comes along, it's read in the input and like already set all the state inside as to what to include and what not to include. So it has to like swap out something in order. Uh, how should I say this? If I didn't swap out the things, like it would not display the entire list of everything that's in the feed, um, just the stuff that you had selected previously. Okay. So like in other words, like all these. Things over here that aren't selected it would be the only things you'd see. Then to would, select would not be the things would not even show up. Okay. So, um, so yeah, uh, it it took a little while to uh, debug this, but it eventually uh, you know uh, got through there. So I have this handy populate function that populates you know all the list and what's selected and everything. Nice. Um, so yeah, this multi selector is pretty much the main building block of everything. Um, so you got the list box inside, you got the scroll bar, you need to configure the scroll bar, uh, 2.2, the uh, list box, then you need to configure the list box to control with the scroll bar. <laughs> <laughs> That's rather funny. And then you need to pack it, you know, to like put it all into there, make sure that the window is properly sized. Um, so we I was just saying that. So you this set of width and things, but uh, it's dynamic though. And if you ah okay, so it doesn't do that. That was my question there. Yeah. So a TK is uh, kind of weird in that it doesn't like automatically resize things within the windows. Yeah. Um, like maybe maybe for like grid layout it does, but not for like the normal pack. See, that would be kind of like how the Windows forms by default you drag drop and then it acts kind of like that. But then if you do a grid like you're saying, then you can set up in uh, the anchoring and stuff. So like what annoyed me the most is that like the ordering of the second screen here. Um, like I wanted it to be uh, like in the order in the list you selected in. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you selected 11, 12, 13, 14, it would display, you know, in that order yeah. instead of 14, 13, 12, 11. Uh, but I eventually figured out what was going wrong with that. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to, like, detect the screen resolution and divide, like, okay, which wow. one's on the first row, which one's on the second, and so forth. Um, but, like, I don't really consider it that important. So... Like, I kind of have it limited to uh, 1080p screens already. 
So I figure that should be enough. You just set that as a base on and assume for that instead of making it dynamic. Yeah. yeah. I think I think it'll only do like five of these per row. Okay. So like that I think that'll even do like seven twenty P screens mm -hmm. maybe. So very nice. And then you can just hit exit and then goodbye. Hey it works. Yeah. And that is all up on GitHub. Nice. So what have you been doing? Ooh yesterday I uh oh right so this is something different. Ha so a few days ago, maybe almost a week ago now, I guess, uh, I forged a, a sea serpent flint striker, and it actually works. It, it makes very nice hot sizzling sparks. So I'm trying to sell it on eBay. The last one I sold on eBay didn't work quite so well, and I, I said so in the listing. So I ended up selling it for a penny for the $6 shipping. <laughs> uh, so that one, I'm assuming the guy probably bought it just for the piece of flint that was included. Uh, this one actually is a legit one that works. And I think I had a couple people watching it, like three last time I looked. So I might actually sell it and make more than a penny this time. Maybe. You have one bid. I have one bid. So we'll see if I get more than a penny this time. Because it's a better striker. It, sh it should be worth more. It, it sparks really nice. So I'll be sure to hurry up and edit this podcast and post it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that everyone else has a chance to still get in on the bidding. Until Friday... At 8.29 p.m. Mm -hmm. So that's great. So if you uh, want to submit feedback to the podcast, you can do so right on the page, uh, right on the nexus.tv. Uh, so I think mom said that she submitted something, but I didn't see it. I didn't see anything in my spam. So, um, and don't forget that today is International Backup Awareness Day, so back up all, back up all your flint strikers. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yeah, as mentioned, my brother will be moving in. Uh, so, uh, yeah, keep a, uh, keep a close eye on that. Uh, and then like, maybe finally do something with, uh, uh, with my old computer parts and put them in the server. Um, so, yeah, the, the thing that kind of annoys me is that uh, downstairs I have a CRT, mm -hmm. which, you know, does like the analog plug. Yes. Uh, the GPU on, or rather the, uh, the motherboard, because like it's an Intel chip, has integrated graphics on it. But the board only has like HDMI and DVI plugs on the board. So that means I'm probably going to have to put in the existing NVIDIA card that I have down there and use that. See, for the adapters, I know I had gotten my adapter for my Raspberry Pi someplace and it wasn't that much money. Like it was like a couple of dollars. I just don't know HDMI where it to TGA. Yeah, it was some sort of a like it's got a box on it, huh? And it it does work, but uh, don't buy just the cable that has the VGA in HDMI on the one side. This don't actually work. <laughs> so, uh, like, I, pretty much all I'm just looking for is just a passive DVI to VGA mm -hmm. adapter. Like that's pretty much all I want. I thought I had one. I looked around and I guess I gave it away or something, or like you know, dropped it in the box with my other video card that I uh, sent off to uh, a Utah Chris. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, uh, let's see. There's that and uh, oh yeah, uh, I'm I'm going to be uh, bed shopping uh, for said brother and also getting a new mattress for myself because the one I'm using is over like is like 20 years old or something. So the question is, are you giving your brother your 20 year old mattress and keeping the new one for yourself then? I don't think he would appreciate oh, that. okay. I'm just curious because he's like, I'm finding a bed for my brother and I'm shopping for a mattress for myself. I was like, okay. Yeah, um, that mattress in the other room is not going to leave much else for anything. So, um, oh yeah, and finally replace this chair. Like I've been wanting to do it for years. There you go. So you have everything all upgraded and ready to go. Yes. Ah. So, any big plans for you? Mm, probably going to buy the house here. It looks like it's going to work out coming through. Yeah. So waiting the appraisal, but uh, I think that's going to work. Cool. So, yeah. So uh, you're going to have to invite us all up there sometime. Sometime. So, um, yeah, I guess that's it for now. So have a good one. You too.